Well, I'd like you to look at uh, Revelation chapter 12, a text that we started last week. And if you could look at Revelation 12, and what that text was, if you remember, it is uh, a text about the devil being cast down at midpoint of the tribulation. Kind of an interesting text. And what I decided to do was not simply to teach that paragraph, but that paragraph is part of a story that began before creation and culminates in Revelation 20 when Satan is in the lake of fire. And so what I did was I, last week, I I started something that was a 13-point message on what theologians call the entire career of Satan, his origin, fall, what he has done in the Bible, this shadowy figure that appears all through the Bible, and then is defeated by Satan at the cross, and then he is put underfoot uh, at Christ's coming and then destroyed at the, at the final judgment. And so what I showed you last week, uh, as is typical, was half of a 13-week, 13 uh, 13-point 13 message, that I showed you the first point was that of a decree of God before all time. And it was a plan for God to have creatures in his image that God would manifest himself to and God would share himself with. And that is called the decree of God by which all things will take place. The alpha all the way to the omega seen in the mind of God. We see it page at a time. God sees the whole script. The whole play is in his mind. Nothing surprises him. Not all things please him, but nothing surprises him. And then you saw, secondly, that God had an angelic creation, creatures of intellect, will, and emotion, super creatures, the angelic realm. And then you have the angelic uh, rebellion, number three. Satan now lives. For God to show all of his attributes, there had to be the arisal of evil. Otherwise, you would have always wondered, What would he do? Would there be forgiveness, mercy, wrath, patience? What would he do? The old uh, apologist would say that from eternity, evil was a hypothetical, uh, just hypothesis. If there is good, then there is necessarily evil, though we don't know what it is. With the creation of the angelic realm, it went from a hypothesis to a hypothetical possibility that these creatures could choose. And the fall, it went from a hypothetical possibility to a, a time and space reality, it occurred. And then it was spread through the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden that chose Satan over God. And we end up with the mess we're in now. And that's why the mirror looks like it does every morning. Okay, because we, man will die. Uh, so you had the rebellion. Isaiah 28, I'm sorry, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, speaks about... Uh, Uh, The pride of the bright one, the son of dawn, Lucifer, la luz, light, the bright one that rebelled. And so Satan lives. And then number four, you saw the creation of man, Genesis 1-1, to be a display to the entire angelic realm. As the apostle Paul said, that the church was that the manifold wisdom of God could now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities and the heavenly places. As God would say to Satan, have you seen my servant Job? Isn't he something? And so you have the creation now of man and the universe that will demonstrate the worthiness and the greatness and the image of God. And then uh, within number four, man's temptation by the devil and then man's fall. And as a result, God's kingdom. Adam, you will be fruitful and multiply. Don't eat of this tree, eat of this and have eternal life bestowed upon you at the tree. And there will begin now in light of Satan's rebellion, there will be the kingdom of God that will be established through the weakest of all creatures, man. When I consider the heavens and the works of thy hand, what is man? that thou art concerned with him, or the son of man, that thou dost take note of him. But you've made him for a little while lower than the angels, crowned him with glory and honor. David said, what is man? What would happen 
if all of a sudden the animal realm turned on us. Have you ever run for your life from a bumblebee? I have too. You ever woke up at night with, with lice and begged for death? Yeah, we're at the mercy of the, of the, of the natural realm. And so God has taken the, the only creature that is symbiotic on God. All animals have their life from God, but they don't know God is there. They just do what they're hardwired. Man, apart from God, will not last moments. He's like a mayfly. And so God has shown his greatness through the weakest of the creation, from man. What happens if the animal realm turns on you? What are you? You are brisket. You're mutton. That is all that you are. Have a Merry Christmas this Christmas. And so you have man's fall. And now the world is commandeered by the devil, the prince of the power of the atmosphere. The whole world lies in the evil one. Man is called the son of disobedience, the child of wrath. By this, said John, the children of the devil and the children of God are manifest. You're born in sin, you're conceived in sin, you're brought forth in rebellion, and the only way you will get out of it is to be born again. That's it. How can a man go a second time into the mother's womb? No, you must be born of, of heaven, of God's spirit. And so the human race had been commandeered. And right after that, number five, you have a promise. The seed of woman will crush the serpent's head. The serpent will wound his heel. The solution to man's evil will not be good works. It will not be reincarnation. It will not be education or science or transcendental meditation. It will not be uh, mushrooms from Mexico, if you were from the 60s. It will not be through LSD. It will not be through any of that. It's going to come by a man who will die for what you did and will rise from the dead and bestow upon you his immortality that happens to be the focus of all of the Bible. The seed of woman, Jesus Christ. And then you see a corrupted world prior to the flood from angels who sinned and did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode. And then God wiped it clean, aberrant humanity through the flood. And then we have a new start. As you had Adam and Eve in the garden, now you have Noah his three sons and wives coming off the ark. And we have the nascent nature, the animal realm coming off. We're going to start all over again. That's Genesis chapter 9. By Genesis chapter 11, man had rebelled again. At the garden, I'm sorry, at the, the uh, Tower of Babel. And now you have 70 nations going forth. All of them alien to God. They will invent their own religions. Man will not be an atheist. You have to send him to college to make him an atheist. Man is a natural born God enthusiast. He just will not take Yahweh. He will make something of the creation into God or he'll make himself God. And so you have the nations that will go forth, the 70 tongues that go forth from Bible languages. They will intermarry and you will have the races, you will have the nations, and you will have uh, the gods that now arise. Garden of Eden, mankind was commandeered by Satan. Tower of Babel, the nations are commandeered. And that's why when you look at the news, it is such a pleasant thing to look at. It's the madness of the nations. And then you have number six, the creation of a nation right in the middle of it. A hundred-year-old man and a hundred-year-old woman that can't have a kid for nothing, and they have a miracle kid. His name is Isaac, who has Jacob, who has the 12, who incubate in Egypt, and they become two million they go to a land dead center of the nations called Israel and they will be the people of God. And they will have a book whereby as it is preached that man can have answers to where he came from, answers to what the problem is. He can have prophecy to how the solution will be from Christ and he will have the law of God to show him right and wrong. And he will even know the future as to what's going to happen. He will know the beginning, he will know the end, and he'll know where he is and what his duty is, the nation of Israel. And yet, Satan opposed that nation, he deceived it, he divided it, and he destroyed it. Uh, God sent his son 
to call them back. And there you see the slowest, most painful death in the Bible. The crucifixion of God by his creation. And the Son of God dies, but in the miracle of God, as Joseph said, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Samson's riddle. How do you get to the wedding feast? You better guess that riddle. Out of something bitter came something sweet. And out of the dead came something to eat. The cross. You got to guess that and you got seven days. And then it's going to be judgment day. Well, you have now Christ in the mystery of God. Through his death, the, the worst thing of all time becomes the best. Sin is redeemed and paid for. Man is reconciled. God is satisfied in his justice. And it's as if God takes the cross like a knife and cuts the tendons of Satan. And his arms drop to his sides. And now God is just and able to go in and take man out and remove him from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. And that period of time in our Bible would be called the age of grace, and it's still going on for 20 centuries. Are we glad? We're glad. How many of you 40 years ago were toast? A whole bunch of us. We're glad that God had mercy. And so right now, the kingdom of God is not in its final form, but it has been instituted. That the, the strong man has been bound and someone greater has come into his house and is now plundering his possessions. And that's us. You want to get a good picture. Incidentally, as we go out and preach this marvelous message that the Bible is true, God has come, his son has died and risen, and you can have eternal life for nothing but accepting the gracious gift he's given. Is that message met with wonder, joy, and happiness? No. No. The, the problem with man is that he doesn't know who the enemy is. His best friend, God, is his enemy, and his worst enemy, Satan, is his friend. And so it's hard to get man because you have to, man's will is not free. It is a slave. He has to have a freed will, and that comes by the grace of God. He has to open man's heart, and man fights it. He doesn't want it to be open. But God now opens his heart to respond. But that's the world that we're preaching to, a world that holds them in contempt. Did you ever see Mel Gibson's The Passion of Christ? Uh, it's the best representation of Satan of any movie that has ever been made. No one ever comes close. Watch it for Christmas right after Psycho. You need to watch that. <laughs> and then The Grinch That Ate Christmas. You need to read and watch that one too. Satan in the movie, I don't know who thought of him, but he was a theologian. No one can see him except Jesus. And, ooh, is he a beast? Is he ugly? He's beautiful. You can't tell if it's a man or a woman. He's androgynous. He's in a cowl. You never, he's in the shadows. He never walks. He moves through space. He slithers. And he appears and no one can see him but Jesus. He's got dead eyes like a shark's eyes. They're black eyes. He's emotionless. He's not a caricature of evil. He is beyond evil. He is absolute dispassionate. And he's always staring in the face of Jesus. And as Christ is being beaten and scourged, you see him appear. No one else can see him but Jesus who's being scourged. And you see he's holding something. He's holding a baby, an infant. And you wonder, what is that? He's holding his child, man, you. He's holding his child. This is man. And Jesus gets to look at the human race, as to what they think of him and what he is doing. And the baby turns his face and looks, and Satan looks at him, and the baby looks at Jesus, and he has this face 
that is the perfect picture of what man thinks of his delivering king. Nate, we got a picture of that. He's just ghastly. That is you. And that is me. When we heard that God's word was true and he gave his son to die for us, we looked at the scourging of Christ and that's the way you responded. Right? Right. It's the way I responded. There is a look of contempt. There is a look of hatred on his face and Satan's eyes are gazing upon his child. You go out today and grab somebody where you're eating out at and say, can I tell you the story of Christmas? The son of God became a son of man and would die upon the cross that we could be delivered from Satan's power and our own ineptitude and impotence and be children of God by faith and give God all the glory. And you look at the look they will give you. That is the look. They will look at God with contempt. And so that is where we are preaching. Thank you, Nate. Have a Merry Christmas. That's mankind. Well, where are we now? We're in the middle of the age of grace. Satan is accusing us before the presence of God. How, we don't know. And thus, as Jesus said to Peter, Satan has demanded permission to sift you, plural word, you men, like wheat. But I've prayed for you, not that you won't be tempted, but that your faith won't fail. And when you repent, you need to be hurt. You'll turn and strengthen your brother. Satan will work out for a greater good through trials brought upon you. Well, who is the greatest servant of God in the Bible? Lucifer. Willingly or unwillingly, he is used for the greatest good. Who do we have to thank for Jesus' death upon the cross? Satan was the instrument. God was the efficient cause. Satan was the instrument, we're the recipient. Well, now what we're waiting for, I've shown you the past of the devil, I've shown you the present, where he is right now. Incidentally, if I preach this on CNN, will I get applause? I'll get that baby looking at me right there. One of our staff said that I should put Kendall's face on that baby. I didn't think that that, I thought that was completely out of place. He can be an angry elf, however, at times. (laughs) But I've shown you the past, I've shown you the present. What's the future? What's the future hold? As you see the future crammed down into Revelation, you see the final enactment of the devil. You see, number one, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 and 4, the mystery of lawlessness. Why does sin go on? It's a mystery. You can't know. God is saving a people while all of this evil is happening. Paul said the mystery of lawlessness is now at work. Man's going down. Until he that restrains is taken out of the way and then Antichrist will be revealed whom Christ will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. The one whose coming is in in accordance with the activity of the devil with all power and signs and false wonders. Right now, you never know how evil Satan could be because something is restraining him. The angel said to Lot and and Sodom, you must come forth because we can do nothing until you are gone. The presence of God's people restrained what could happen. Someday the restrainer will be taken away. You and I will be removed. It is called the rapture. And then that lawless one will be revealed. Well, when he is taken away, the tribulation will begin. God will simply say to the earth, you like the devil. I'm going to give him to you. And you will have a seven-year honeymoon. And so number 10, at mid-tribulation, this is the text that you saw in, uh, in Revelation chapter 12. That in verse 7, there is war in heaven and Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon and the dragon, Satan, and his angels, the demons, waged war. They were not strong enough and they are cast out. Verse 9, the dragon, the serpent, the devil, Satan, the deceiver, 
who deceives the whole world. As I have said, the book of Revelation is not just the revelation of Christ, it's the revelation of all things. Any questions you ever had about the devil, here they are. He's called the serpent of old. Who was there in the Garden of Eden? It was Satan. Here you're told. Now we find out who it is. He is thrown down. And then in verse 10, the angels cry out and say, all in heaven, salvation, power, and the kingdom of God and his authority have come. The Tower of Babel is beginning to crumble now. It's like a movie scene where the earth shakes and now the tower starts to come down. Satan is now cast. He is in the presence of God. He comes and goes now and he accuses. Uh, he is summoned by God. Book of Job. Have you seen my servant Job? Yes, I have. And I've got a plan. I'll let you go this far and I'll use you. And so he accuses us in the presence of God. Well, here he is cast down. And in verse 11, it's interesting how we know the true believer in Jesus Christ. I heard a sermon one time by a fellow named Haddon Robinson when he was at Dallas Seminary, professor of, uh, hermit of homiletics. And he gave a sermon on how you know a true Christian. And he used chapter 12, verse 11. This is it. That's a true Christian. They overcame Satan because of, number one, the blood of the Lamb. Their confidence is not in themselves. It is in Jesus Christ and not the liberal view of Jesus, the good guy. But this is the blood of the Lamb. The Lamb meaning he died on the cross for what we did. And it is his blood that saves us. Amen? That's why if I ask a Christian, if you were to die now and stand before God in heaven, hey, why would we let you in? What would your answer be? A true Christian responds in a nanosecond. He said, why should he let me in? Because of Jesus. Because my sin has been punished. My righteousness was lived out by another and provided me by faith. I am as secure for heaven as Jesus Christ is at the hand of God, the right hand of God. And so we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb plus anything, the offer is removed. It's Christ alone. Sola fide. And in verse 11, because of the word of their testimony. How can I know it's the real thing? Because they will confess him openly. They will acknowledge Christ is my Lord. And when they stumble and fall, God will raise them up. And so faith without works is, it is a dead faith. Works do not save you. Works evidence true salvation. And so how do I know if a guy's alive on the side of the road? Feel for the pulse. That's the pulse, the word of their testimony. And in verse 11, they didn't love their own life. They have taken up their cross and they submit to God. And how long in verse 11 do they submit? Even until death. There are no ex-Christians. There are former phonies who now are found out. But there are no ex-Christians. They are faithful till the day of their death. Now that Dr. Haddon Robinson said that is the classic verse on salvation. Well, in verse 12, rejoice, O heavens, meaning the beginning of the end has come. But woe to the earth. You like the devil? I'm going to give him to you. You ever have a teenager that went mad? Don't stand and point or, or call out, but you ever have a teenager that went crazy? that liked the blessings of the home but would not submit to the rule of the home? You ever had that happen? What do you do with them? If they will not submit, you say, you know, you want the blessings of our home, but you don't want its order of God, Father, Mother, and you. And so I can't let you destroy our home. So you want freedom? We're going to give you freedom. Here's a sack of groceries. Take care of you for a month. Here's a tank of gas, take care of you, and a Ford Pinto that explodes, if you remember. <laughs> and here's a month's rent on your efficiency, and you're going to have to find you a job now. With your job skills, you can get two, three dollars an hour. Oh, all right. But you're on your own. You want freedom? You got freedom. You like rebellion? Honeymoon, welcome. We're going to give it to you. Arrivederci, chili con carne.
you're on your own. How long do you think that will take? About 20 minutes. Open up. Yeah, and that's kind of what God does to the world. If you had been God, this would have occurred in about Acts chapter 3. But God has spent 20 centuries so far showing that he is patient. And so he is cast down now to the earth. And this at mid-trib is where the horror of the tribulation begins. What Jesus called the great tribulation. It's like you see chronologically things that happen. The, the trumpets, the woes, the bold judgments. Chapter 12 lets you do an overlay. Do y'all remember when we had uh, those acetate images on the, what'd you call those? Overhead projectors, remember that? Does anybody remember an overhead projector? Okay, <laughs> yeah. You would put down the tri you'd put down the chronological events of the tribulation, and then you would lay down the overlay of God and Satan. And at this point, Satan is cast down to the earth. So God says to Earth, "Welcome to your king. Here is the prince of darkness, and he hates you." Well, here you have Satan cast down. Incidentally. Do you remember in the book of Luke, there were 12 disciples that went primarily to the 12 tribes. And then in Luke, there's another group of disciples. How many are there? 70 in Luke chapter 10. 70. Luke is the only Gentile author of our Bible. And it's believed that he's the one that tells us that Jesus had 70. Because how many nations went forth? From the Tower of Babel. How many languages? 70. You can count them in Genesis 11. And so you have 12 to the 12 tribes. And then the Christian church will have 70 that go to the world. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts. And whenever he sends them forth to go preach, they come back in Luke 10. And they say, the demons are subject to us. And Jesus says to them, I was seeing Satan fall from heaven like lightning. This is what he was seeing in Revelation 12. Jesus sees the future like it's the past. And he said, when you were preaching, I saw it. Satan is going to be defeated and cast from heaven. And you guys are the beginning of it. What is the church? We are the establishment of the kingdom of God, the reclaiming of planet earth. Are we the kingdom in its final form? No, we're not. We're a mystery of it, an anticipation of it. Someday, Revelation 12 will occur, then Christ will return, and the kingdom will have its full manifestation. And so we, have, we are those that have begun right now the retaking of man, the reclaiming of man. One of the young men came by my office between services. He was a young heathen at Denton Bible in its early days. He was a musician. And he came by and we just rejoiced at the last 40 years of his life. He and his Christian wife, his Christian kids. And I remember him when he was that baby right there. And Satan took him and Christ took him out and so we're the beginning of the kingdom of God. So if somebody wants to say to us, what will the kingdom of God look like when Christ returns? I say, come on in, let me show you. We got all kind of races, all kind of, of uh, uh, socioeconomic strata, but we all sit together and we sing songs about one person and we've all been made new. This is what, this is a little glimpse of heaven. Let me comfort you right there. This is the germinal sense of heaven. Different peoples all united in love and their devotion to a nail-pierced king. And so, at mid-trib, Satan is cast down. And then you have, in chapter 19, let's look ahead. Chapter 16 through chapter 18 is the great tribulations crushing of Babylon. And then in 19, verse 1, hallelujah. Verse 3, hallelujah. Verse 4, hallelujah. Verse, where is it? 6, 
Hallelujah. The hallelujah chorus. It's the one Hebrew word in your Greek New Testament. Y'all know that? Hallel means praise. Yahweh, praise to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hallelujah, praise be to Yahweh. He made promises. And at the end of Revelation, has he kept them? Yes, he has. Hallel Yahweh. Well, uh, here you see Christ return in chapter 19. And then we see in chapter 20 and verse 2 and 3, uh, Satan is bound for a thousand years in verse 2. He is cast in verse 3 into the abyss and he is bound. And we begin the kingdom of God. Uh, you can dismiss uh, West Point, Annapolis, Air Force Academy. You can beat your swords into what? Plowshares, because we're more interested now in agriculture. You can beat your spears and the pruning hooks. We're more interested in agriculture. Our problem is all the bounty of the earth. Men will study war no more. The nations will resort to the root of Jesse. I don't think that's symbolically true right now. I think that is uh, going to be true when Christ returns. What's the world going to be like without war, with Satan bound, without a world system? We don't know. What's it going to be like when the lion lay down with the lamb? I don't know. When the child plays in the viper's den? I don't know. When men study war, no more. And in some sense, death will be, it's it said in Isaiah, men will be thought of a curse to die at a hundred. So we don't know what it'll be like. Only Adam and Eve saw it for just days. And so we have the kingdom of God. Israel will be exalted. Uh, there will be Ezekiel 40 through 46, a millennial temple greater than anything we've ever seen. Sacrifice will occur like we enjoy communion as a memory of our salvation. There will be the memory that God's promises to Israel have come, and tr have come true. It says the world will nurse at Israel as a bountiful mother. That they will be blessed because of the faithfulness of God to his covenant people. And so that is the return of Christ. Why do we have to have that in the Bible? Because if we don't have the kingdom of God, Satan wins. History never ends in the glory of God. Now it will end. When Christ returns, how many knees will bow? How many tongues will confess? Every. God will put all things under the feet of this final Adam. God will win. That's the way you are when you're God. You can be stubborn. And God will win. As Paul said in the book of Romans, he will put Satan in submission under our feet. We will rule with him. And so here is the kingdom of God where Satan is bound. And now in chapter 12, we have to have a test. Now stay with me right here. In the Garden of Eden, man was in perfect innocence. And he merely is told not to eat of that tree, eat of the tree of life, receive from God eternal life. Did that system of innocence fail? Yes, it did. So now we have man from Abel on sacrificing unto God for his mercy, covered in the skin of the sacrificial animal, looking forward to the coming of the seed of woman. And man is to, quote, do good and to sacrifice. He is to, Old Testament guys were saved by faith, and Christ who would come. We are saved by faith in Christ who came. Our focus of light is brighter than theirs, but their inkling was salvific. Someone will come. How did it work when man was just told under conscience to repent and believe? We ended up with the flood where evil was in their hands continually and the thoughts, every thought of their heart was on evil and we wiped it clean at the flood. Then we did something new, this will work. We started politicians. We started government. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, will his blood be shed? We're going to have government. How do we do? Tower of Babel, the nations, the gods 
Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, bloodshed. No, it was the survival of the fittest. Government didn't work. But still, God has his elect and he calls them to faith and sacrifice and the coming of Christ. Like Melchizedek, like Job during that time. And so then, what we do with the nations is we're going to take one nation, a miracle nation, 100-year-old man, 100-year-old woman, and a miracle kid. Isaac, who will have Jacob, who will have, uh, I'm sorry, Isaac, who has Jacob, who has 12 that become the tribes. They incubate for 400 years in Egypt and become a 2 million person nation. How do they do? They killed their brother Joseph and lied to their daddy and broke his heart and fell into idolatry in Egypt. So did the period of promises to the Jewish nation, follow me because of the goodness and faithfulness of God to Abraham, did that bring Israel to repentance? It did not. Did the nations turn to the God of, of, the, of nature? They did not. And so what we did then is we sent the law, Moses, and he wrote it down. How did Israel do? It took them 40 days. Moses came down the mountain. It was a frat party. You remember that? They rebelled after 40 days. He gave them the law, gave them the temple, gave them the prophets. Finally gave them his son. They killed him. And so the law failed. The time of the promises failed. Government failed. Conscience failed. Innocence in the garden failed. Man will not submit. Now we're in a period where God has commanded all men to repent. Having fixed a day in which he will judge the world through a man. Having furnished proof to all nations that he's raised him from the dead. Has India repented of their pantheism yet? Has China repented of their atheism? Has Russia repented of their atheism? Has Austin repented? They have not. Has secular man repented? Can we still speak the name of God in our institutions? We cannot. So has the church age brought mankind to repentance? No. Had God not in his effectual grace drawn his elect, nobody would believe. Someday we're going to have the kingdom. And when we have the kingdom, you know, when Christ returns, there not, may not be 3,500 people on the earth. The Bible says that the earth man will be as scarce as gold. Unless God had intervened, Jesus said all flesh would have been killed. And so it may be scarce. He comes. He brings us with him to rule. You're not going to see the second coming. You're going to be the second coming. You're going to see Austin coming up as you descend. Okay. And so we come with him. The Old Testament saints, the faithful, are raised. So there's Old and New Testament saints. Those that died in the tribulation are raised. You have this enormous company to rule with Christ. Over this, probably like the ark, a symbolic human race. For a thousand years, just work it out sometime. If you got a thousand years, and when he comes, he's going to take the Gentiles and the Jews, found those that have the mark of the beast, they'll be removed. So who goes into the kingdom? Gentiles and Jews that survived the tribulation, believed in God, and at the judgment of Christ when he returned, were exonerated because of their belief in Christ. We may not have 600 people going into the kingdom. And as we go into it, how many babies can you have in a thousand years with a, a millennial earth? It's going to be in Revelation chapter 20 and verse uh, uh, 8, like the sand of the sea, in a thousand years. There are going to be people you have to teach them by faith that there was sin. What's that? Great, 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 great. Grandpa, can I ask you a question? Our great King Jesus, what are those holes in his hands? You want to know? I'm going to tell you. You're kidding. No. No. We killed him. He rose because he can't die. And so man is going to be saved in the kingdom by looking no longer in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. And so they will believe in him. We'll have a millennial system, Ezekiel chapter 40 through 46 of a temple where men will sacrifice in memory of what Christ has done. Israel will be what they were meant to be, the joy of all the earth. Question, has man learned? Will man still produce that ugly baby up there? Revelation chapter 20, verse 7, the thousand years are completed. Satan will be released 
from his prison. He will come to deceive the nations and the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. That is the name in the book of Ezekiel for the enemies of God. Man is still the ugly baby. Write that down. He is still the ugly baby. He's still a rebel. The book of Psalms says at this time, the wicked will feign obedience for fear of thee. Right now, good guys are the, not the home team. Then good guys will be the home team. And so in verse 8, he will come up, and in verse 9, they will come up to the broad plain of the earth and surround the camp of the saints. These, are, these people are simply called millennials. <laughs> See, that's a joke. That's just, I'm trying to relieve the tension just a little bit. They're glorified teenagers is what they are. People that are born under righteousness. And you know what I think Satan's lie is? I don't think it's any different than it's ever been. You know, this is good earth. Yeah, you ain't the only one thing you don't have. What's that? Freedom. What do you mean? You can't do anything you want. Only God can do that. Huh. You know what I think? I think this is a big scheme. You need to fly. Get your motor running. Well, on the highway. Same song, different verse. So, this last dispensation, look at him. Innocence, conscience, promises, law, grace. I'm sorry. Innocence, conscience, government. Promises to the Jewish fathers, law under Moses, grace now. Six, perfect seven, the kingdom. Will man repent? No. He will not. What are you going to do if you're God? Give him a garden? We've done that. Give him promises? We've done that. Give him a super nation? We've done that. Give him a savior? We've done that. Rule him? We've done that. Only thing left. Let's burn this thing down. Let's raise the wicked. Give them a body to endure eternity. And they will stand and we'll separate them. And there you see in verse 10, the devil, and that is his final destination, is the lake of fire. With the beast, final government, the false prophet, final religion. And now in verse 11 through 13, 15, we're going to have a family reunion. All of his people. And so we will raise the dead. Heavens and earth, it says, will flee away. We're going to burn this thing to the ground. It says the elements will melt with intense heat. The earth and all of its work, it's going to go back to Genesis 1 verse 2. Darkness on the face of the deep. Then we're going to make new heavens and new earth. It doesn't show us about them because we couldn't handle it. You got to wait till you get there. What does it look like? We don't know. It's only in the mind of God. We'll have new heavens and a new earth. And then from glory, there'll be the reunion of heaven and earth right here. And the eternal city will be among men and men will look upon him, the father face to face. Well, before that happens... Verse 11 through 15, we're going to take the wicked. A wicked man right now is held in what is called Hades. And Hades, it states in verse uh, 13, will give up its dead. If you die now, it's like a lawnmower cutting the grass down. You go in the grass catcher that is Hades, and then you go into the incinerator that is the lake of fire. Man's soul is eternal. He's in the very image of God, for heaven or from hell. You and I will have resurrection bodies to endure heaven. They will have resurrection bodies to endure hell. And so they are raised. See, everything in the universe will glorify God, even the wicked. They will be the base notes, the minor key of hell to glorify God. And so in verse 13, they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. It says in verse 12, the books were opened. We're not going to have an imprecatious judgment of just knee-jerk we're going to look at your life. I don't know how he'll do it. I think he'll do it in a nanosecond to everybody. Here is your life. Here's all that you did. You are guilty. And then in verse 15, we'll open the book of life. Here is your only hope as the lamb. Let's look at you. Did you? You rejected him at every single moment of your life. You would not have him. And so now I will give you your wish. You will have nothing to remind you of God. No light, that is of God. No family, that is of God. No neighbors, that is of God. 
No joy that is of God. No personhood that is of God. You will have you to be stimulated for eternity, claustrophobic and black. You will have no nature. You will have nothing that you will see. The creation is of God. And so you will have yourself and your king and your prince, the devil. You will have him. And your governor, the beast, and your religion, the false prophet. I give them to you. Your God, your king, and your, prince, your priest, and your king. You've got him. And then in chapter 21, we begin the eternal state where we shall reign forever, and the Bible signs off. You don't get to see the rest of it. You've got to die to get there. You've got to pass through the veil. And so, when we come to the end of chapter 22, Satan is in the lake of fire, and then we will see thy kingdom can come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You know, when I used to work at an ideal aluminum plant, I was a baby Christian. There was a guy who ran the sill machine. I would cut sills. There was a guy that would cut heads off the, on the windows. And I would cut the sills. And I got to talk to him. I was a baby Christian. We got to talk to him about the Lord. And I remember he looked at me and he said, I said, are you a Christian? Do you know Jesus? Have you ever believed in him? He said, no, I believe in Satan. I said, I beg your pardon? He said, I'm a Satan worshiper. And I didn't have the sensitivity then that I have now. <laughs> now look there. You're a follower of Satan. Yeah. You're an idiot. I said, you know where the name Satan comes from? It comes from the Bible. It doesn't come from Hinduism. It doesn't come from Islam. It comes from the Old Testament, New Testament. Did you know that? Really? You ever see what happens to him? He is forever in the lake of fire that burns with brimstone and torment forever and forever with his angels and you. He was a smoker, and I remember I took his Bic lighter. And I went, Chicken. hold your hand over there. You can't hold your hand over that for three seconds, and you want to go to eternity. After he ruins your life to spend eternity, you are an idiot. I don't know what happened to him, but was that some good witnessing on my part? It really was. I don't want to believe in Jesus. I want to go it on my own. Great, fool. We'll use you in the satanic choir down there. But we will use you. All things have their purpose, even the wicked, for the day of judgment. You want to sing major notes? You want to sing minor? Which you want? You'll glorify God. Whew, we need a hymn. Nathan, where are you? Come on up here. You find a Good-looking soprano, bring her with you, all right? <laughs> Pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you for this Lord's Day. Thank you for this Christmas season. When we have to tell the world something so inexplicable, so wonderful, so marvelous, so great, that they have to take it by faith, that God has come among us and has given his very life for his creation, has died that we might live. Thank you. Father, if there is anybody here that has enjoyed Christmas and has never understood it, might this day with empty hands they receive the person, the living reality of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit of God that he would perform the Father's will and introduce them to the life of the Trinity. Might it be so. Amen. How about a hymn? This is Lauren Christner right here. She, you ever read in Psalm 67, it says the psalm is sung according to Alemoth. It's Hebrew for the maidens. That before we sing, we're going to bring in the sopranos. All right? So that they can sing with the hairy leg Levites like me and Nathan. <laughs> we're going to sing an American Christmas carol. You know that? Most of our Christmas carols are English or German. This is an American one written by a guy named Fisher Boyce, Link City County, Tennessee. Anybody? Okay. He uh, is from the city of Plainview, Tennessee. He is a dairy farmer. He was written in 1911. Plainview is now uh, the Buchanan Road exit on Interstate 24 in Tennessee. 
So this is a small place. He wrote it in a dairy barn sitting on a milking stool because he had 11 kids and his house was too noisy to compose hymns in. And so Fisher Boyce wrote this. This is an American Christmas carol that lay in mothballs until you can feel the Tennessee twang to it, the Southern gospel, until a bunch of uh, uh, Southern gospel musicians took it and it became well known again. It is called Beautiful Star of Bethlehem. Ever sing that? It's a beautiful American uh, carol. Give us a downbeat there, Nathan. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining afar through shadows dim, giving a light for those who long have gone, guiding the wise men on their way unto the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn, guiding the wise men on their way unto the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem. Second verse. Oh, beautiful star, the hope of light, guiding the pilgrim through the night, over the mountain till the break of dawn, and into the light of perfect day, it will give out a lovely ray. Beautiful star. of Tennessee. <laughs> Isn't it great to have 11 kids and you can't get no peace? <laughs> you end up writing hymns. Father in heaven, we are indeed so thankful for the light of Bethlehem that led wise men and shepherds, Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, rulers and ruled, led them to the place where they looked upon uh, a marvelous message for unto you this day in the city of David is born a Savior, Christ, Lord. And this will be a sign 
you're going to see something you've never seen. A baby will lie in a donkey's feeding trough. The highest will assume the lowest. And I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. For God will give him the throne, the house, and the kingdom of his father David forever and forever. Lord, how can these things be? For I am a virgin. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you and the holy thing will be called the Son of God. Nothing will be too wonderful for God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.